Welcome to this episode of my Inner Circle Live Calls. I am super excited because I have a guest on with me tonight, Dr. Tom Morcroft, and he's not only a guest, he's become a very dear friend of mine. He's like a brother to me. Um, and we're going to talk more about this later, but you may not know, but last year I ended up having a really gnarly injury to my leg and my knee uh, where I broke my leg and I had a pretty bad injury to my knee. And Tom came and brought his biohacking tools and helped me so that I could heal faster and just really take care of this temple that is my physical body. So thank you, Dr. Tom, for coming and joining us tonight. I'm so honored to have you here so that we can talk about biohacking. Yeah, thank you so much, Elena, for having me. I'm really excited. I mean, and I just love the way you frame everything about supporting our temple. So I'm really excited for this conversation. And, you know, we were just talking before we um, got on the call, how you were just recently at a conference talking about, um, you know, some of the different aspects of biohacking that a lot of people are not familiar with, but really need to know. So what I'm thinking is that let's start out the call tonight to talk about the birth of biohacking and how it was originally used and how it has quickly changed um, and why it has completely, you know, really why it's shifting for a lot of people. So why don't we start out um, with you introducing to our group, like what is biohacking? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, this, it, it, you can define it many ways. And I think that one of the things is like, I've always heard it's like, kind of like if you're looking at for, different ways to kind of enhance your body's ability to function at peak performance. I really think it, it kind of, you know, if you think about like Dave Asprey and people like that, who like really were sort of the, the godfathers or the OGs, if you will, of biohacking, it was the desire to optimize human performance. And so that you could be at, a, at the peak pinnacle all the time. And then I think what happened was it started to really catch fire because everybody thought this was a cool idea. And as you alluded to sometimes pushing to the limit all the time actually ends up diminishing our actual overall ability to function. So peak performance, I think has to be that balance of really optimal performance along with optimal recovery. And I think across the, the I think in the beginning, the, the, and the concept was to really be at peak performance all the time. And I would suggest that maybe what we want to be is at peak passion all the time but maybe not so much peak performance because peak, per well, depends on how you define it. Cause peak performance includes in my mind, peak recovery in order to do peak performance. But I think there's this misnomer of pushing all the time. And so I think that's why I'm really so excited to be able to have this conversation because I think originally biohacking was trying to, to crack the code for longevity, crack the code for performance, understanding that we do need to do that recovery and care for our self care but I think a lot of times when you read about it online, we kind of miss like that part. It's just, you get the word extreme and peak, you know, kind of always attached to it. There we go. Um, you know what, there's, there's so much truth in what you just said. And I want to add to that in that um, because you and I also work with a lot of, you know, chronic illness, uh, clients and patients, you know, people that have been struggling with the sickness for a long time, a lot of them get their interest gets peaked when they hear about biohacking, you know, take this nootropic so that your mm. brain fog will go away and it will work and your brain will work better. And I can't tell you how many countless clients that I've had who will, you know, see these ads come through or they'll watch, you know, they'll watch a masterclass or a summit and it's all talking about, you know, you know, basically without saying it is talking about, you know, getting optimal performance for your brain. And then afterwards, all of these, you know, um, offers start coming through for nootropics and all of these things that are essentially biohacking tools. Can you explain to the chronic illness client or patient why they don't want to go after those types of things until they get themselves back to a state of homeostasis or back to baseline health? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, um, 
I, I, we, I, we, we both know Dave Asprey. And I think, you know, like I mentioned a second ago, I was kind of the godfather of this whole movement, but like to him, I, I found this definition that I think is a great jumping off point where he talks about biohacking being this global movement based on this idea that you can change the environment around you and inside of you. So you have full control over your biology. And I think that what's really interesting about that is anybody with chronic illness knows you don't have full control over your biology ever. And even in peak health, I don't really think you have full control. We're living in this beautiful vessel that's doing certain things and we can work with it. And I think that the challenge when we're chronically sick is we're not just kind of like, hey, I'm doing great and I want to feel better. So my my sort of brand new car, I'm going to jam on the on the on the gas a little bit more. It's kind of like we're a little broken down. Maybe we've got three re really good tires, but then we've got that spare sort of, we had a flat last week, we haven't gotten it repaired. And now we've got one of those little donuts on. So if we have a donut on our car and then we jam on the gas or we jam on the brakes, we're going to lose, we could lose control. We could pop that tire. We could spin out like from acceleration or deceleration. And then there's all these new things. They put that don't go over 55 and we've all gone over 55 on one of those, but why aren't we? Because no one knows what's really going to happen. <laughs> and I think that the thing is when our biology is sort of out of control and we have multiple different levels of toxin, we often will develop a lot of sensitivity to different things are in, in our environment. And certainly we can talk about whether sensitivity is good or bad or a little of both, but it's like we can push the body beyond its ability to, to, to heal. And like, as you referred to that lecture that I, I've been doing a couple of people, I can't believe it. I went to uh, international Lyme conference. And I kind of proposed talking about this. And I thought they just wanted to hear about medicine and all this other stuff, but I slid it in under this fancy term of getting improving energy naturally and intracellular detoxification. But there's two terms that are really important. I think that will kind of um, inform us here. And one is a concept called hormesis. And hormesis is this concept of a little bit of stress for the right, like kind of the right dose of stress for the right amount of time will actually benefit the body. The question is, how do you figure that out, right? Because in, in thousands of articles on hormesis, researchers have found it's on average the best hormetic stressor, the one that actually helps you get the maximum benefit before you kind of start to d break down the, the body is about 20 or 30% over your normal baseline. The problem is this is in the normal person, right? The non-ill person. And so many people who have Lyme disease, mold exposure, mast cell activation, dysbiosis, the whole nine yards, know that sometimes they smell a little perfume and they explode, or they have one cookie with just a little bit of gluten, you know, or a little extra sugar. So how do we figure out what the optimal push is on our system? And that's the problem. These, these nootropics are like, blast it, you know, go from zero to 10 right away. And so our body doesn't work that that way. It wants to be kind of gently. So what will happen is you have this curve that goes, it's almost like a bell shaped curve. So it goes up and up and up and up and you're getting benefit, benefit, benefit. But then once you get to the part, you'll start to see diminishing returns before you actually get to toxicity and detriment to the body. And it's that downward slope that most of us miss. We start to go down and we go, Oh, I'm either my treatment's not working. So I, I, I turn, change all of it and throw it away and start over, which may not be the right thing to do. Or what's very common is, oh, well, I was doing really well on 250 milligrams of liposomal glutathione a day, maybe 500 to 750 is better. And that's what I think we do a lot with the nootropics in chronic illness is we just push so hard that then we end up crashing and it's taking so long to recover. So that's just like, I think, it, it's about turning the dial up and down with a lot of control rather than just sort of being a bull in the China closet or in the China shop, I guess. And if you really want to get the, the best use out of biohacking to help with your performance, once you get back to a state of health, um, really being, um, diligent enough to track your metrics and know when you've hit that point so that you don't pass the point of diminishing returns so that you know right where you need to get to get that you know optimal performance out and then knowing how much time that you need to rest to recover after because you are pushing the engine really hard you're pushing the engine hard to get a high performance 
you know, you're putting add additives in the gas, so to speak, but you can only do it so much. You can only do it for so long uh, before you end up causing damage instead of just getting the high performance that you want. So this is mm. good. So we talked a little bit about how, um, you know, when you're already in a state of health and you want to push the performance for a short period of time, we've talked about that. Um, and, and how, you know, we really need the, um, the, I would say like the maturity level to be able to know when we've had enough and, you know, you have to really track your metrics. You have to track your body metrics to understand how far you can push with the biohacking before you end up hurting yourself. We've also talked about how, you know, it's, it's not, it's not really, don't use it. If you're chronically sick, I know you want to feel better. I know like all we want to do is just feel better. And if we think that there's a pill we can take, that's going to like make the brain fog go away and all that, like it might work for a little while, but I'm telling you, if you do not figure out what's causing the problem, what's been causing all the problems for so many years, you're going to end up causing more harm down the road than good. So you know, to Dr. Tom's point, to your point, it's like we want to get back to a state of health before we start pushing the optimization. Now, let's go into the third area I want to talk about of how, you know, there are some biohacking tools that we've discovered that were maybe originally used for biohacking purposes for to push our performance levels that now we're realizing can actually be used to help us heal when we mm. have had an acute injury or if we've had some chronic illness. So let's talk about that because I think we may spend more of our time in this area for the rest of the of the talk. I don't know, we might die, diverge and go somewhere else, but, <laughs> but how can we use them? Because when I first learned about biohacking, you know, I was like, oh, this is not for my chronically sick patients. I need to protect them from this because they're gonna hurt themselves. But, but over the last couple of years, I've learned more about it. And, you know, now I'm getting ready to take another course. And I've learned a lot from you and some of my other colleagues about things that we're learning, like peptides, for example, things that, that we're mm -hmm. learning about, like peptides that can be used in the healing process. They can also be used for pushing our performance. So why don't we use an example of um, BPC-157? right? And how, and how some people use it to push their performance and give some examples because you, you and I have talked about this, like you're hardcore into the skiing and all that. And you, you use it to help push your performance and, and speed up your recovery, but then how we might use it right. in an injury process too, or for someone who's chronically ill. I, I think you hit the nail so on the head, Elena. It's like, I use it to speed up my recovery and you use it to speed up your recovery. Those can be two. So the word recovery is individualized. So whether I'm a biohacker who's trying to use biohacking concepts to push peak performance, I have to not compare myself to Dave Asprey or Ben Greenfield. I have to compare myself to Tom Warcroft and my baseline, and I can learn from them. And, and like I use BPC 157, which is um, a term for, it's just body protection complex 157. And it's really, it's, it's a great orally. It's really great in your gut in the short run, but in the longer run, or if you use it subcutaneously, it's an amazing central nervous system anti-inflammatory, and it also will bring down inflammation, muscle, and joints. So yes, I'll use it for recovery, but I can use it from recovery from whatever the injury is, right? Because peak performance is an injury state. So this idea of hormesis is we need to break down the body to grow. So actually, a lot of times we get into chronic illness because we missed the signal that we needed to slow down and focus. And so we went so far that now we're riding around on four tires that have, or four rims that have no more tires on them. Right. So it's really interesting to me because, and I really like where, where, where Dave is talking about like controlling your own biology. I would love for my own, I would love to learn about my own biology so that I can work with my own biology 
in tandem so that I can optimize that. And so when we're chronically, so in my case, like I'll go out and do a bunch of skiing, maybe you twist a little something or you just spend a couple of days going a little hard because there was amazing snow last year and all that. Or maybe you make a wrong turn, if you hit a few bumps and you torque your knee, right? But in both cases, the same medication could potentially be used for inflammation, but for different in a different broader scope. And I think that we're not, if we're looking individually at the recovery that we need or the treatment effect we're getting from that peptide, it allows us to apply it in a, in a, in a much more um, sort of scientific and compassionate way rather than just continually pushing. And I often think one of the things that I've talked to you about so many times is how you focus on sleep. And I love talking about sleep because it's the core time where we kind of, um, our memories are consolidated and our brain detoxifies. But what's so, and what I think it's so important is that we can track our own. Somebody the other day asked me, well, what heart rate variability do you want while you're sleeping? I go, you know, I'm like, I, I don't know because I don't compare myself to other people because I know people who have double mine who are really sick. And I know people who like mine usually in the 40s, the 50s on an aura ring, but everybody measures it differently. And sometimes I'm higher, sometimes I'm lower. And I know people who are in the fives and tens who are super healthy. So I think a lot of it is there's a general guideline, but it's really like what I've always, and our conversations have always been around is how do you individually apply it so that you're getting the optimal result? And the other part that we learned from this kind of concept of, of looking at hormesis is in order to recover from chronic illness, um, we always have to bring up this concept of polyvagal theory, I think where many of us understand we've heard fight or flight, right? This is our sympathetic nervous system. Again, I'm driving my car, a little puppy dog runs out in the street. I, I slam on the brakes, I avoid the dog, thankfully, but my heart's going like this, my pupils are dilated, I'm sweating. But that goes away really quickly when I'm, my stressor leaves, my acute stress. But in chronic stress, that can really break down the body. And then the other side of that is like, the, the concept of fight or flight is, I can actually win. But if you've been sick for so long and you feel like you can't win, you can't get away from it, you can get into this freeze state. And the freeze state also suppresses the immune system. And the challenge with that is you have to feel safe in order to heal. The problem is safety to the nervous system and safety to the human brain are totally different things, right? So you're looking at it and you go, hey, I know that I'm safe, but your reptilian brain says, hey, safety is familiarity. So if I'm familiar and I'm comfortable with being sick, if I change it too much, it will actually make you go backwards in order to protect you because it thinks you're, you're changing too much. So if I push too hard when I'm trying to recover from chronic That's illness, I can actually pull myself backwards faster. And I think we've all seen this with chronic illness patients. They're doing, they're just like, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, they're taking off so quickly. I'm like almost too quick. And then it's almost like a bungee cord pulls them back and they smash into the wall behind them. And it's like, it's partly because we've overwhelmed the nervous system. And that's why I think the measurement of the metric is so critical because we have objective evidence that we've learned through this kind of biohacking concept that we're applying to the unique individual and saying, hey, how can I optimize your performance? And in this case, your performance may be healing. How do I optimize your healing? It's I push you just enough, but not too much. So how do I know when I need to recover? The only way to know that is to measure it. And that's and that's one of the magical things about, you know, understanding these concepts is that is that you can optimize your ability to heal if you're in a state of chronic illness. And, and so let's talk about some of the fun things that you and I um, have been using with our clients and our patients um, that can help them faster, really move the needle on, on, on recognizing and witnessing some palpable change when they're really struggling. So for example, you know, we I'll start with BPC, but then we can start talking about some other ones, but BPC is so amazing. You know, you can take it through injection to help with the systemic inflammation and the neuro the neurological inflammation and tissue inflammation, but you can take it orally 
for those that might be struggling with some really significant GI issues. And we just got to get that inflammation down. And yes, we can do, you know, um, like a um, liposomal liquid glutathione. And yes, we can do some other things, you know, like some, you know, um, immunoglobulins to help calm the gut down, like colostrum and things. But then there's BPC oral, like you can do some crazy, amazing things to help bring inflammation down in the GI system that, that, you know, in essence, you're, you're upgrading the performance of your body to be able to bring that inflammation down with BPC. What are some other um, tools that on, that can be used for biohacking to help the body in its healing process? Like just start naming some different things and what they're used for. Yeah, I mean, I you know, again, BPC is a great foundation point. I use a lot of uh, thymosin alpha one, which is another peptide that improves immune function. It, it it's very much an immune modulator, so it kind of brings the lid down, but it also lifts the body, uh, the bottom up on the immune system. So it's not underactive and it's not overactive, and that's available, you know, both as a subcutaneous or in IV infusion, as well as um, it's called thymogen alpha one, but it's available orally as well. Um, so those and, and a lot there's many peptides and i saw there's a question about where do you get them and some of them are like the bpc 157 the thymogen alpha one these are ones that you can get orally all the subcutaneous ones typically need a prescription um so you do need a referral there but you know other things are you know spms or some specialized pro resolving mediators or some of my favorite fish oil extracts immune modulatory anti-inflammatory brain food and they're antiviral. If anyone here is, cares about that these days, <laughs> you know, um, but it, it's, but it's a part of my normal everyday routine. Um, and then, you know, there's all kinds of different things like, you know, low dose naltrexone can be used. There's, as we mentioned, nootropic, there's all kinds of supplements here, but I tend to get really lame. And I'm like, why don't you do the things that, that you were given when you were born, like breathing, right? Because one I of wanted to talk that about love. that next. What are some of the, what are some <laughs> of those things that we can do? Because a lot of people, you know, I've spent a lot of time um, in with our clients in our coursework, in our mind, body energy program, teaching them the concept and the science behind what you're getting ready to talk about breathing, breath work and meditation so that they can understand the significance of it and how profound of an effect that it can have on the body. So just for all of you listening, Dr. Tom Moorcroft, you know, he is, he is a, an osteopathic doctor. So pretty much the same as, as an MD and, and he's getting ready to talk to you about some things that might surprise you. So listen in for this. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting because, you know, one of the things I love about breath, is it's one of the quickest shortcuts to energy. It's one of the quickest shortcuts to autophagy, which is our cellular process, our process of intracellular cleanup, essentially. And it can promote increased uh, mitochondria. It might increase mitochondria is essentially another way to say more energy, right? But the, the, the beauty of it is we're actually allowing our physiology, our biology to tell us how much we can get in any given moment. And so a lot of times, like I do a lot of Lyme disease and other chronic infections, and we talk about, well, methylene blue, it's a great dye. It's got antimicrobial effects. It's got, um, it'll promote mitochondrial energy production. And if we use red light therapy, that promotes mitochondrial energy function, as well as makes methylene blue even more, um, just because I'm thinking of other biohacking things, more sort of antiviral and antibacterial, but you got to go buy stuff and, and then use it. And then you're with methylene blue, your urine's blue. Breathing is like, it's amazing. And I love like as a framework for breathing, I look at Buteyko breathing method and Dr. Buteyko was a Russian aerospace um, scientist, physician who was looking to deal with some of the changes in physiology and space, figured out how to fix asthma and vasodilate, fix Raynaud's, open up your clogged nose just by breathing. And when we study that work, we basically have found that the human, that most humans are over breathing. So if we're breathing too much, we're all focused on that O2 sat, right? We've all got one of these after the pandemic. Problem is if we have too much oxygen in our blood and not enough carbon dioxide, we actually have a harder time delivering the oxygen to our cells. And this is called the Bohr effect. 
And essentially what's happening is too much, you know, you actually need more carbon dioxide so that you can deliver more oxygen. And all of us who don't have emphysema for the most part are breathing based upon our carbon dioxide sensor, which is so exquisitely sensitive. And so if, if we can teach ourselves, train ourselves through the volitional control over respiration to tolerate a little more carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide vasodilates. So that means like the, the vessels in your brain and your heart, your fingers and your toes will improve. Your, your nose will open. You'll drain out all that chronic sinus stuff. Um, but then it also, so, and it's an, also an amazing anti-anxiety drug. Then it'll also promote increased nitric oxide, which also does more vasodilation and lo and behold is a profound anti-inflammatory. And so most people are breathing 12, 20 times a minute. And I would say that that is wishful thinking. Most of my people are breathing way more than that and very shallow. And so when we start to learn how to breathe a little more slowly, we actually tolerate, and it's simple because we're all over breathing. Well, not all of us, but those of us who haven't trained in some of this tend to be over breathing. So all we have to do is slow it down a little bit, even like do a five and a half inhale, five and a half seconds and five and a half seconds exhale. Now you're all of a sudden breathing about six times a minute, which is wonderful. Instead of 12 to 20, now your carbon dioxide bumps up and you have all this beautiful um, response that calms your nervous system down, but it's so overlooked because it's just like, Oh, as long as you're breathing, you're good. You know, it's like what the doctors tend to be trained in. But it's like, when you start to do this, you're also going to be pushing on that process of mitochondrial biogenesis, creating more mitochondria, which are those cellular energy factories and promoting this intracellular cleanup, that autophagy, just by slowing your breathing. Now you can get real fancy. I love doing intermittent hypoxemia and do all this breath work and you do holds for 60 seconds or two or three minutes, but it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just nice and simple. And I mean, breath is the only, when you look at our nervous system, you know, where I briefly talked about the sympathetics and all that stuff, the only real part of our nervous system that we have volitional control over of the automatic functions is our breathing. It's partly not automatic and it's partly we have control over it. So it's, it's a wonderful inroads, Elena. So I think it's a great place to start for almost everybody and it's free. It absolutely is free. You know, we should do, um, I'm going to invite you back uh, another day. Everyone put, put a one, I'm volunteering you for this, by the way, put a one in the chat. I know box. I'll say yes. <laughs> if you would like to come back for another inner circle where we do some interactive breath work, put a one in the chat box. Now we do teach breath work. We have, we had one of the top yoga breath therapists working with us for many years and we were so fortunate to have been able to create a lot of recorded video sessions, teaching you the foundations of breath work and then taking you through some, some breath stuff. Well, some of the breath work that Dr. Tom can introduce us to and teach you is going to be, I would call it more advanced, not more advanced in the way that, you know, Dr. Tom, I don't think our, our group would be ready for some of the harder stuff because they're, you know, a lot of them are not feeling very well yet. So we don't want to upregulate their nervous system. But some of this downregulate, down regulatory uh, for the nervous system breathing, mm -hmm. but also some of the stuff that can help like clear the sinuses and open up the lungs for breathing, um, you know, that will actually help vasodilate. I think that would be a lot of fun. And it looks like we have a lot of people who would be super interested in that. Certainly looks like it. I think it's a great idea. And I think one of the things is most of the breath... I would say at this point in my, in my work, more than 90% of the people I work with are also chronically ill. And so it's, it's, you can really be introduced to, it's the beauty of breathing. You just like we've been talking, you do it where it fits for you. Right. And you know, it's really interesting too, cause it's like, we're talking about kind of how to kind of biohack your, your physiology for healing. And um, when, when you look at um, some of the ways that we could other ways that we could promote autophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis, cold exposure, a little bit of heat exposure, but not as much as cold exercise, but it's got to be the right kind and the right dose. Really interesting. Right. And fasting. And so then I started to look at fasting because I'm, I'm, I do a lot of talking about the glymphatic system, this brain drainage system. And I'm so just enamored with how the body naturally heals itself because 
when I was sick with Lyme disease, babesiosis, and heavy metal toxicity, and it took me about 13 years to get better. But about six years in, when my back was against the wall because nobody could tell me what was wrong. So I just started doing all these natural practices. And it took me two years, but I was like 70% better. That allowed me to do two things. One, create the opportunity to meet the doctors I needed to get the other 30% done. Um, and then my body to be ready to receive their treatment. So I think a lot of people start doing the tr the treatment because it's a pill or a dagger, you know, or whatever. And it's like, this is the thing that's going to cure me. I'm like, actually, I've polled bazillions of doctors and I ask them the same question. When you give someone an antibiotic for pneumonia, do you cure their pneumonia with the antibiotic? Do you sterilize their lungs? And even the most conservative physician says, no, we bring down the level of the bacteria until the body's um, immune system can recover and take care of the rest on its own. I'm like, why are we not doing this all the time? I have to point this out to them. And then they just go back to treating people like everything is just a scalpel or a, or a pill and they're fixed. But I think what's really interesting, so going back to the brain, if you look at brain research, when they're, the drainage system of the brain gets um, you know, disrupted, there's a, little, there's a lot of, the only things we know how to fix it with are lifestyle modifications. And one of them is intermittent fasting. And for any of you who are, can, you know, who do intermittent fasting or um, aware of it, this was really crazy and enlightening to me. So Elena, they said, intermittent fasting, fix your brain detoxification pathways is not eating for 12 hours every other day. I was like, that's not even fasting. <laughs> like I mean, to me, cause like I'm more like the don't eat for 16 to 20 hours and then the remaining hours of the day shove it in or don't eat for a couple of days now granted i've been i've been healthy for 12 plus years so i'm a little bit more on the extreme end you know and some days i just eat normal but i guess the point was what we talk about in biohacking i remember all these people you hear on the biohacking podcast are like oh start okay go from 12 hours of not eating to 13 to 14 get the 16 quick because you need that and then maybe you want to go to 20. And then I know people who don't eat for 23 hours and shove it all in an hour. But what we found is when you actually research it, you don't need to be that extreme. You can actually take it easy on your body, just give it a little bit of that hormetic stressor, and it will actually perform better. It will heal quicker if you push it. And so I always think about like, we're, you know, I've, I was a competitive runner in high school and then, and then um, hockey, but hockey doesn't really correlate too much to this conversation. But then I love riding my bike, as you know, but it's like when you're training for a long distance, you have to balance out pushing it really hard and recovery. And one of the hardest things for everybody I know, professional athlete or the person who was really close, but never made it was recovery. So everybody's good at pushing it because that's kind of like the warrior and just pound the wall. But what we found was if you're truly, if you're like somebody who would go out on a hundred mile bike ride and you can average 23 to 25 miles an hour, which is bitching fast, you probably need to go out on a flat ride of 12 to 13 miles for an hour for a couple hours to get a true recovery ride. And almost nobody has the patience for that because it's too gentle. It's too easy. But if you do it, you actually boost your performance dramatically over if you do like a 15 or 16 mile an hour re recovery ride. So most of us are actually not afraid of pushing too hard. Although some people are, most of us are afraid of going a little too slow to give ourselves that compassionate recovery time. And I think that that's what we learned from this brain research and all the other techniques. So just give yourself the chance to push yourself a bit, but also recover. Don't be afraid to push it, but and get a little comfortable with uncomfortable, but definitely give yourself the recovery time. And I think that's where we really can give ourselves the love. And, you know, I can take it another step forward with, you know, we can reframe ourselves around, you know, it's not the pushing it so hard that is going to help optimize our performance and make it better, or it's not pushing so hard that's going to take us to the healing that we want. It's the things that we don't realize are the most important parts of our healing, the things that's the biggest part of the medicine. It's being gentle with yourself, sitting still with yourself, 
doing your breathing, doing your breath work, doing the meditation, all the things that we teach in the MBE program, the things that I know that you're teaching in your program too, that, you know, this is why I go in and I like to teach the concept, then the science to prove why it's so important and why Mm -hmm. it's so beneficial, you know, Um, and then so that hopefully, and put a one in the box, if you've gone through my program or you're going through it and you've heard me say this before, put a one in the box of why we need to focus on this foundational stuff because it's not just foundational, it is essential. And if you push mm-hmm. so hard, like for example, you know, if you're if you're going through like the trauma work and the emotional release, the, the uh, trauma resolution work with us and all of that, how many times, put a one in the box, how many times have you heard me talk about it in months one, two, and three of our program? You've got to learn how to downregulate your nervous system first. That is some of the most powerful work. It's the most powerful medicine you'll ever do for your body and your life and your entire life is to learn how to master the downregulation of your nervous system before you go in and start doing the deep trauma work. You can't do the deep trauma work. You can't do the hard stuff, that stuff yet, until you learn how to down-regulate your nervous system. So this is the same thing. It applies to sports, like what he's saying. Like when you go work out, if you really want to win the championships, if you want to qualify for the for the Olympics, you want to do all that, the difference between those who make it and those who don't are the ones who know that the stretching afterwards and the rest and recovery afterwards and the gentle movement afterwards is more important than on the days that they're pushing themselves so that they can hit the world records that they're looking to hit. It's the same thing with your healing. It applies in all facets of life. You've got to, you've got to, the stuff that we think is the least important is the most important. Put a one in the box if you're getting it. Put a one in the chat if you're understanding that, because if there's one thing that we can drive home tonight, when we're talking about biohacking too, the biggest biohacks that you can do, I mean, yes, we've touched on peptides. We've touched on a few prescriptions that you can do. We've touched on nootropics. We've touched on that. But did you hear Dr. Tom, when he was talking about some of the most powerful ones, he talked about breath work, just breathing, learning how to downregulate your nervous system with breath and sleep. Dr. Tom, what is another free thing that we can do that can really move the needle and and help create transformation in our ability to heal? Uh, I think it was really hit on in the chat too. Caroline mentioned discovery and I, I love that word. I use the word awareness a lot, but I also think that I want everyone to become aware of the possibility of it, a different outcome, right? So to be open to the fact that what we think is going on, maybe we can actually recover quite quickly, or it might take a while, but we have the opportunity to heal. And, you know, I love about the mind body energy part um, that you teach because the mind and the mental constructs, our mindset and our heart set are probably to me what we, you know, I mean, We've, we've probably many of us have heard the whole neuroscientist talking about what you think about, you bring about, but literally the thing that you think about the most is what you, what happens in your life and you bring it into you. So in a lot of the work we do, it's all about mindset and it's about, and it's not about me trying to change your mindset, but it's about me helping people develop the awareness that they can actually have, there could be another possibility for healing. There could be another possibility of how to interpret this. Like, and I, we, we always end up talking about healing so much because from these physical, you know, chronic illnesses, but I think there's such a mental component and part of my healing journey involved. Um, my dad was kind of an a-hole most of my life, you know, and he was always just kind of like, Oh, you know, I, every time I tried to do something, I just felt like there's this, all this emotional and, and verbal abuse that went on. And I was trying to figure out like what to do. And then like, I went out, he passed away about six, seven years ago, but I was at a, and, and thankfully we had patched it up enough that it was cool, but I was at a course afterwards, an NLP course where we were talking about this. And I went through an opportunity that I think is really telling is I, I sat down with this group of people. We're doing a power box, right? So you have a little box, you walk around it, everybody, you know, stokes you up and then you hop in and you get your power pose. And then the idea is you do this a couple of times. So you, you anchor in 
this power, this feeling of, of this elation. So I talked to this one guy in my group and I said, Hey, what happened? He goes, well, I was in college and I hit a grand slam at a championship event and it carried me all around. And he's like, ah, you know, and somebody else is like, well, you know, I, I had barely qualified to go to this beauty pageant. I just figured I'd show up and I ended up winning. And then I, all this stuff opened up. And then the last guy goes, yeah, I'm 40 years old. And I just sold my tech startup for $42 million. And then I said, Hmm. Uh, yeah. Every time something goes well in my life, about five seconds later, somebody kicks me in the crotch or stomps my skull on the curb. That's like literally what it felt like to be around comparing myself to other people. And I was about to leave the room and not participate. But I said, I am so worthy of this. I told myself no matter what, and I promised my family I would play full out because there's a breakthrough waiting for me too, right? But I don't know where it's coming. I'm going to be open to it. And so I started walking around this box. Like the only thing I could think of was there is I played an international hockey tournament when I was in 10th grade. It should have been the pinnacle of my life, right? This is like such a, this is the 1980 miracle on ice where the U.S. beat the Soviets in the semifinals. I mean, my hair is standing up because as a kid growing up playing hockey, this was Mecca, right? This is like going, this is like literally playing hockey on the Holy Grail itself, like in the Holy Grail, you know? And so, but I, I was just like, I'll pick this. It was pretty much a crappy experience. Like I scored a ton of goals. My team lost every game and my dad was a jerk. And so anyway, I go around this box the first time and I go in and I'm like, yeah, whatever. And we're supposed to do it three times. And then as I'm walking around the second time, I step in and all of a sudden I reflexively take like a, a hockey wrist shot. And I was just overwhelmed by this crazy emotion. And then I remembered my dad in the stands and he was screaming out, go boy, go boy, in this weird voice that I'd never heard before. And I'm like, what is wrong with you is what I felt in high school. But in this moment, I go, oh my God, for the first and probably only time in my life, that man showed up 100% the way I had asked him to, the way I had dreamt about my whole life. But because I wanted it to show up a different way, and I've been so traumatized by thinking about all the other things, in that moment, I couldn't accept it. And I basically said F you in my head and probably gave him the bird. So what's really cool about this is I realized that there was a different, he was actually trying as best he could with all of the resources he had. But the other part was now, that was when I was in 10th grade. I was in my early 40s when this happened to me back and rewrote my entire history with that man with the new understanding that he was actually trying his best. He didn't have all the tools he needed, but he still was trying his best to love me. And it totally revolutionized my entire life, changed everything. And my whole, and I saw changes in everyone in my family who didn't even know that that event had happened. And so how does this go? And, and wrap in everyone's health here. Well, part of it is you can rewrite your preconceived notions, you can change your past, you can create your future and, and on and on and on. Right. But you can actually, actually decide what the meaning of whatever happens is in your mind. And as Mary Morrissey says, and I've tried to train with like Bob Proctor and Mary Morrissey and all these great mindset gurus that were all in the secret and all this other stuff. They're like, it's first created here in the in your mental emotional plane before it's created on the physical plane so the awareness or the discovery that we were talking about is that when i'm starting to think it whatever i attach that strong emotion to will actually manifest in my life and so my question is talk about meditation right different people have different uh opinions when they hear that word and different feelings i love the definition of meditation that is to become familiar with so I would challenge everyone to become more familiar with the state that you actually want to live in, become familiar with the state of health that you so desire. And so, because most of my people are all day long meditating on what they don't want and not on the way they want to feel. And the thing is, you're never going to forget you don't feel good, right? Wake, wake up and write a new script because that will remind you, just decide what you want and then put emotion behind it, and then it'll manifest. And so it is so powerful. I mean, I literally spent like 40 plus years hating a person for a, miscon for a misconception. Now let's, let's pretend that he was a complete a-hole and he never loved me. 
he's dead. It doesn't matter. The only thing that it matters about the way I think about what he thinks about is what's happening inside of me. I could send venom to him all day long, whether he's alive or not, and it'll, it'll affect him a micron. But every micron of venom I send to him has like a million fold negative impact on me. So I choose me and I choose love and I choose these open new possibilities. And I also know that my dad really cared his best and I do actually love him and don't think it would be, he was me, his actions were a whole ish, but it's like, get into it and enjoy it and rewrite your story because you are so worthy to receive healing. And if anyone has ever told you that you're not, or you've ever had the conception that maybe you weren't, I'm here to tell you that that's probably not true. And you could reevaluate that and, and really be okay with receiving the love. So many of us who are sick are like caregivers, right? We help everybody else. Let's bring it in and receive for ourselves first. And then we can give even more because this world is a little bit dark at the moment, right? I mean, let's all shine our light from our, our heart and lead by example. So that's the most absolutely. powerful biohack I know of. <laughs> yes, I absolutely love that. And you know what? Again, in our Mind Body Energy program, in month one, I start everyone with an exercise to journal. I I say almost exactly the same words that you were saying that when, oh. you know, when we our brain is constantly creating stories. And they're typically ruminating over the same stories, like a broken record all the time. And we're not even aware of it because we're just going about our day. And then the stories are running in the background. And those stories always have emotions attached to it. And a lot of times, you know, those, those who have been really, really sick, those all I'll just say those of us, because you and I were, were both in the same boat. We have such similar backgrounds with our childhood and our illnesses and just all of the things. And so, and so, you know, when, when you, how do you get a grip on that and start changing the narrative? So the first, one of the first exercises I do with everyone is I tell them, grab a journal and I want you to start writing a script, your movie script. You're the director and you're writing the movie script of what you desire instead. What is the outcome? And I want you every day to go into that journal and I want you to add the most minute details, like you wake up in the morning, you take a deep breath and what do you smell? What do you smell in the room, right? Like like I, I smell lavender in my room in the morning, right? And I see the sun coming through the window and my sheets feel really good, <laughs> you know? And I stretch and I look over and I have somebody there that's, you know, that, that who loves me. And this is, and I created that. And, and I used to not have that. That started with a journal. It started with me focusing on what I wanted instead, instead of focusing on the issues that I was struggling with. And how many of you put a put a one in the box? If 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 you're as you're hearing this, you're going, holy shit! Like I do focus on what I don't want. I'm stuck on the stuff that I'm suffering with. That's all I can think of is how I how can I get out of this? I feel this way, and I'm upset because of this, and I'm upset because of that. If you're not putting a one in there, if I don't see more, I know you guys are lying or you're not paying attention because that's how the human brain works. The thing is, is that once you learn how the human brain works and you learn how we are weaving the very fabric of our reality that we're experiencing through a thought, it starts with a thought, then that creates the emotion and then that literally comes into our reality we are creating our reality once we realize that and we can get a grip on that and we start working to change it by rewriting the narrative and that's why i want everyone who goes through our program you should have at least two journals by the time that you get to the end of your 12 month program if you don't have two at least two full journals you are not writing your script the way that you should because it should have every detail of every single thing in your life, everything, as if you were in your own movie script right now. Is that, do you see where I'm going with that? How many of you are understanding what I'm saying? So like right now, in this moment, you're literally pretending you're creating. And so you're not alone. You're not lonely. Your body actually feels really good and strong. And you're looking great and all the things, all the things, all the things. And you add every single detail about every single thing in your life that you desire down to the clothes and the way you feel and the way you smell and the people in your life and what your house looks like in every single detail. 
And when you get so focused in on being the director and taking that control of your creating your reality and writing everything down like that, it brings it to your consciousness and redirects your focus away from your circumstance. And it redirects your focus onto the desired outcome. And that also helps you more easily make the shift in your habits that are going to help take you back into a space of health, healing, vitality, joy, love, all of the things that all of us want as humans. It's so true. And, you know, I, I, I love the, you know, I don't know that everyone knows this, but literally you're like, do you want to hop on and do a biohacking one-on-one? -on -one? I said, sure. And then we just showed up like two minutes before we started and just said, hi. Like, and it's like, literally we're saying the exact same thing, you know, and it, it's so amazing. It's, it's funny when I trained with um, Bob Proctor, he always told us to get a book called the art of acting by Stella Adler. And she was just back in the day. She, I think she trained brand, uh, brand Marlon Brando and all this other stuff, but it's like, he's like, you wake up in the morning, you read a script. What script, if you don't like the script, pick a new one or write a new one or to the people who had mentioned that they don't have, they have a harder time writing. I would say, well, you know, you can draw, you can sketch, you can feel, and then you can start putting words to it and writing. I think a lot of us have a hard time writing or feeling or coloring or drawing because we don't do a lot of it. Right. And some of us are more blocked than others. I mean, you know, I did an exercise earlier today where like it took to write 10, two, 10 things I liked and 10 things I didn't like it took me like 40 minutes. Whereas like, if you asked me to say it just out loud and like turn on Otter and record it or something, as you know, it's like really hard to get me to sh shut up. So I'm like, maybe instead of writing, I talk it right and, and play around. But it, it, it is, it's really an interesting thing. And then I, I love the comment about emotions that are more challenging to deal with sometimes than thoughts and behaviors. But I would say like, well, what about your emotions? Is it what about your thoughts? Is it like what, like, what is that? It's that awareness, like what? The, all of these things that our body is bringing up are gifts. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning, like sensitivity. I was very, very sensitive as a kid. I knew that there was sap running through trees before I even touched one. And before anybody told me there was sap, I knew there were earthworms under the ground because I could walk on the ground and feel it. Then my parents thought I was insane and tried to beat it out of me so they could keep me safe. I'm like, okay, now we have a discrepancy where I'm incongruent. This is my experience. Anybody feel like this in their lives with chronic illness? I am feeling one thing. Everybody else tells me I am not feeling that or what I am actually experiencing is wrong. I mean, how traumatic is that? Right. And so, and then it was like, at, when I got sick, I started to go, oh, my sensitivities are here to teach me something and heighten my awareness. Now, when I'm sensitive, I have to learn how to, well, I, I think it's safer for me personally, to learn how to turn the Rio stat up and down. You know, sometimes I want it like when I'm walking through the airport, I don't want to be overwhelmed by my sensitivity to, you know, the people around me. I want to kind of turn it down, but I also want to have the ability. So I become aware that my sensitivity is a blessing. And it's also something I work on to control and I actually have control. So it's that discovery process, that awareness that sometimes it's like, I ask people who have Lyme disease, I'm like, so what's Lyme here to teach you? And most of them give me the finger, you know, cause they don't want to hear that. It's like, no. And then I'm, you know, like that would mean that. And then I say that you have control over this. I'm like, no, I got bit and it's somebody else's fault. It's another thing's fault. I'm like, but you have it now. So what responsibility are you going to take? And then I ask a question. I'm like, so when you think about Lyme disease, are, are you fighting Lyme disease or are you sending it love? And I'm like, can you love the Lyme disease that's in your body? And, and if I haven't gotten the finger already, I either get the finger or I'm getting punched at this point. But the bottom line is I say, hey, look, thank you so much for being a part of my life up until now. I'm, you are no longer welcome in my body, but I appreciate what you are here to teach me. Remind me those lessons as you leave. Right. So I'm not saying it's OK to stay in me, but I'm also not going to say, oh, you're evil, because as soon as I say you're evil, you know, like immediately you constrict and you hold it into you. But it takes a 
level of growth and awareness that you're not saying it's okay to be sick. You're just saying the thing that caused you is to kind of get out of the way, you know, and then that opens you up to your immune, because all of these things we've been talking about, the breathing, the, the, the sleep stuff, I saw get up in the morning and go out at, you know, and get some sunshine, which I a thousand percent agree with. And all the things we're improving heart rate variability, which you can monitor. And as you improve your own personal heart rate variability, that means your immune system stronger, more resilient to stress, more resilient to infection. And actually all these practices directly have scientific evidence to boost your immune system in most powerfully, the one that has to do with your heart and your mind. So all of these are, so when you send love to the thing that's making you sick, you're actually strengthening your immune system to help it go out the door. Notice I didn't use the word against it. I said to help it, you know, to escort it out the door nicely. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some would say that it's it's raising your bioenergetic frequency. It's raising your vibration to a point where these um, critters that are in our body <laughs> trying to homestead there, um, they're not going to do so well. They're not going to thrive in that, in that, different frequency. And, um, you know, that's going into a whole other talk that would be fun for us to do in the future, just because are you guys enjoying this? Put a one in, uh, in the chat, if you guys are enjoying this and, and you're learning stuff and we're keeping you engaged with our passion and our intensity, both of us have a lot of passion and intensity. So we really love to teach you this stuff. It really comes from our heart, but, um, that would be fun to actually get in and dive a little bit deeper into even that, um, and how these some of these tools that we're talking about and then connecting it more with how it does change our frequency and how when we can change our frequency, you know, that um, that is really the most powerful medicine there is. I mean, that's <laughs> that trumps everything. And, you know, that's how people at you know, you've been to the Joe Dispenza events and you and I have talked about it and I've been so excited. Every time I talk to you, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to sign up for one and go. Uh, but, and then the, the time passes me, Tom, and it's just like another year has passed and I still haven't signed up to go to an event. But what, what I find so amazing is that all the research that he's doing and tracking these, tracking the shifts and the massive, like quote unquote miracles that are happening at his events where people that have been paralyzed for years are getting up and walking and people that have had these different diseases, all of a sudden they're, they're not able to talk. Now they're talking and they're not able to walk. Now they're walking and all of these things, their, their rashes on their body that they've had for years are like gone by the end of the, of the week long meditations. And that's all from getting back control of the nervous system, down-regulating the nervous system, refocusing your thought through meditation, directing your thoughts to what you want instead, it changes your vibrational frequency, brings it up to where we as humans perform optimally, where we live optimally. And they're not really miracles. They seem like miracles, but it's these people are healing themselves through thought alone. And really, but that thought alone is really, it's just a change of their vibrational frequency, right? Well, and I think what's so amazing about it, because yes, I mean, having been there, I've seen people get out of wheelchairs. And I see it all the time in my practice too, which is like, it's funny, as you were mentioning, I'm just like, wow, there's, I have wheelchair stories too. And I'm like, but it usually wasn't the medicine. It was the mind shift, shift, the mindset shift and the heart set shift that did it. And I talk so much about like healing versus cure. Every, uh, so many people are looking to cure cancer, to cure Lyme disease, to cure mold illness or whatever they may be suffering with. I'm like, I'd rather have people heal. Because that's making you whole, bringing, you know, you, making the person whole and cure usually comes with wholeness, but not necessarily. But would you rather live forever and be a miserable person or would you rather heal, feel amazing, make amends with your whole family and then maybe pass away from your terminal disease? But as a complete person who has closure and their hearts wide open and sending love to everybody. And I think that that's what you like. Joe talks a lot about love. A lot of us do. But I. That's the piece is like when people, because I've spent time, I've gone to two events and I spent a lot of time talking to certain people because I kind of knew they were going to get out of their wheelchair. You know who's getting out of their wheelchair or not because it's they start to love themselves. There's no magic here. And what the other thing that I love what you said, Elena, is 
you notice it all, it happens in five to seven days, depending upon what event you go to. And so time is not really all that relevant. You can heal like that, or it can take a long time. And some of these people were able to start doing things they weren't able to do before, but it might not just be that like, they might not like have remyelinated their entire ner you know, nervous system and cured their MS overnight, but they took away the block to healing that opened their heart and now they're able to walk, but they haven't walked for a while. So you're like, wait a second. So are you telling me that like half of their illness is that their heart is broken? Maybe, right? And so you have control over that. And I'm not saying you did it to yourself, but you have the control to take that next step. And this is what the universe, what God, what source rewards, because you're now in frequency, like you were saying. And when you're in the right frequency, what's really interesting is one of the challenges that some of my folks run into, and maybe some of the folks here have experienced this, is as you heal, your healing journey is a gift that allows you to raise your energetic vibration. And as Dr. Elena was saying, as you get to that higher level of vibration, the bugs are no longer able to tolerate it. So they just naturally move on because you're not an optimal host for them. There are also people in your life who can't handle it. So that whole thing I said about hormesis in the beginning, you can actually pu push too hard on other people. So as you're healing, remember that all those people around you may not have the same strength at the moment to look inside your heart to grow, learn and grow like that. And so when you're turning the love inside and, and turning on your light and healing, remember that those around you, you're leading by example, but also share compassion with them because like your friend might need to change your friend group, but like your family, you probably aren't going to be able to change them. But I've had to change the amount of time I spend with different family members as I've changed because literally they can't stand to be around me, not because I'm the irritating person I used to be. I might still be a little bit too close to people, but, but it's like, it's because I'm at a different vibration and I'm talking and living. And most importantly, that energetic communication is different and they can't handle it. So just remember, that's a great time to turn it down a little, love on your family, maybe go, you know, turn it down so that it's a little bit more the old you but never change who you are and then crank it back up when you leave. But just be aware, that's a great indicator that you're doing amazing work. And so when they start to reflect back to you, their fears, they're, they're uncomfortable and stuff. Like my dad did this to me all the time. And I kind of don't even know if I realize that until right now, but he would always be like, you're think you're doing this too much. You're thinking that I'm like dad, but I'm performing higher than anybody in our family ever. And it's like, Oh, that challenges their reality and that's okay, but you're going to, that's how you kind of know that you're actually making progress. So just be aware that that might be another step along the way of your journey is not just taking care of yourself, but sharing that love and that Rio stat with the people around you. Yes, absolutely. Biohacking 101, everyone. Biohacking 101. This isn't what you probably thought you were going to hear. And a lot of the things are free. A lot of this stuff doesn't cost anything. And, you know, something that, that, um, for those of you who, how, how many of you are first timers put a one in the chat. If you're joining us for the first time, um, please go to our website, go to my, my website at modernholistichealth.com because I want you to read what our mission is. And I'm not going to tell you where to find it. I want you to go through, but you'll see it. I've got my picture there and I talk about what our purpose is. I also have it on our Bio One Sciences website for our supplement line that we've created, which Dr. Tom, I can't wait to go over some of the stuff that we've been formulating. I think you're going to absolutely love it because, you know, mm. I do case studies on everything and I've just been doing some amazing things. But one of my biggest passions that I have right now, I mean, yes, it's, it's helping just like you, Dr. Tom, it's, it's helping like bring these people out of the darkness with their sickness and bring them back into the light with their health. But it's how can we reach more people um, who can afford these types of services where we can still run a business and be successful because we all deserve to be making lots of money. We all deserve to be healthy and wealthy in every, in every area of our life. And, um, 
you know, the more that we make, the more that we can give back. I have a client today who I saw that I'm going to be giving to. She's been with us for almost two years and she had something happen with her Medicaid and her Medicare and all of that. And she's blessed her heart as a, because I am, am blessed. I'm good turning around and I can pass that forward. I'm going to be helping her with some of her expenses and stuff. But going back to what is our mission? Like my mission has become how, how many people can we heal? Can we facilitate the healing of? We're not healing you. We're facilitating your healing by showing you what to do. Mm. How can we reach more people? Because not, you know, there's 1% of the population who can afford, you know, these higher cost programs. And, you know, honestly, to work with Tom and I, it's expensive. Our time is, exp I mean, it's like we, you're, when you get to work with us one-on-one, -on -one, you're getting to work with the top of the top, the elite of the elite. When you want to work with the top people that you pay for that. But, but also on the other hand, if we want to make a big impact, how can we reach more people, because not everybody's in that top 1%. So how can we help the other 99%? And that's where Tom and I have been working on putting programs together. Tom is just a little bit behind me and getting that going. But when we first started, when, when I first started putting programs together, they were $18,000 for a year. And you know what? And you know what? We still have Put a water in the box if you're still with us, because we've had people who got who went through that program and they're still with us. They got their health back. Now they're maintaining their health. They're doing amazing with us. Then we brought it down to twelve thousand. Then, as we were able to take that money and reinvest it to redevelop our processes, to streamline things, to bring the cost down, to look at the common denominators that no matter across the board what's going on, if you can't afford labs, da 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 da, what are we doing that's the same common denominators that's going to get you past that finish line where you can get your health back? And then we brought it down to $6,000. Then we brought it down to $3,500. And now it's below that for a year. And when it's on sale, it's like, I don't know, $1,800 for the year. And you're getting two programs for the price of one when it's on sale. And a lot of the stuff that we've talked about tonight is in the Mind Body Energy program. Um, you know, Tom is teaching this stuff too. So you can get it from different perspectives, right? And, you know, and so, and so check out the website. And 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 I want you to take a look at what the mission is about, you know, a, there are a lot of modalities out there that are free. So don't discount the stuff that we've told you tonight, whether you're in our program and you've seen it and, and you've already been through that or not. And you didn't realize until tonight how important it really is until you got to hear us and see our faces and the passion with which we're telling you this stuff. Or whether you're not in a program and you're just hearing us for the first time and we're telling you the most powerful modalities, the most powerful medicine you can do. This stuff is free. You, you just have to be consistent doing it. Do it. Because this is where it's really going to change the trajectory of your life. Now, I want to move on and I want to highlight some of Dr. Tom's stuff because you're brilliant. <laughs> you are brilliant. And it's one of the many things I love about you. In fact, it's why I was first attracted to you as a friend in the first place because of your brilliance and your high energy because we're both high energy. So I'm like, oh, another person God, like right? me, um, you know, high energy. But you're so brilliant and you're so heart centered. And you have been doing this too. And, and we, you know, Greg and I help you whenever you ask us for help, we're wanting to help you to develop out your program so that you can reach more people also, because the, the stuff you work with, working with Lyme disease is probably one of the most expensive things that a person can work on in their life. When they, when they get with a good, like one of the top Lyme doctors and you are the one from my perspective, you are like the top Lyme doctor in the country, if not the world. And, and, and it is expensive. And you and I have had these discussions on how can we make a more impact for the single mothers and the people out there that can't afford mm -hmm. 12, 15, 25, 35, 45, $50,000 a year to recover from Lyme and all the other chronic diseases that typically come with it. So talk to us a little bit about the program that you've recently launched because it has been a hit. You have had so many people that have been waiting for you to do this who are jumping on. And it's, it's I think right now it's kind of limited. Like you're only taking a few Let's talk about what you've got going on because I, and I want to make sure that when we send our email tomorrow, 
Uh, so we always send an email for the follow-up for the people who couldn't stay on for the whole talk or the people who missed it because of the, of the time zone differences. And we send them a summary. Um, I, tell us everything before we finish this evening of what you've got going on with your program. And then we will take that link and we'll share it with everyone tomorrow. Sure. Thanks so much. And yeah, I mean, I think it's really the key is, is getting that, the, the, it's all available to you. It, it, all this stuff is out there and, um, and Elena packages this in such a way. And I like to think I do too, where it's highly organized so that you can actually get it and, and follow it in a step-by-step fashion. But the biggest thing is the accountability in the community to know that you're not alone and that the community is going to support you and hold you accountable to move forward. And that's really where what we do is so golden. We put it together in such that way. And so in my world, the biggest issue we run into is that people doctor shop and they don't remain focused. It's really that kind of, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, the squirrel going for like the next shiny object. So, um, yeah, we have the Thrive with Lime Blueprint, which is really our group coaching program where we give you all the background in Lime and access to herbs and testing and all the good stuff. But the vast majority of it's this mindset stuff and helping you stay consistent because we have a lot of people even working with other doctors, but they're stuck because they only work on the physical plane. And so we combine all of that mind, body, spirit place to, to really heal the whole human being. So, the, you know, the Thrive with Lyme Disease Blueprint is um, kind of that signature program for the public. And then also one of the challenges in my field and where I spend a lot of time is actually training practitioners because there's such a need for more practitioners to see people. So we're doing that as well. And then we have our private medical practice. So as you know, I like to stay busy and, and I've got enough energy to do it. So really always appreciate the opportunity to share my passion and, and to hear about, I mean, the work you guys do is incredible and so inspirational, you know, and, you know, I just said like, Hey, out being out there and being in a community, joining one of these programs, like, Elena has where you get to work with people who know what they're doing, but, but also maybe equally important, their hearts there to help hold you accountable and to create a community that supports you as you learn and grow. And you do go through that discovery. I think the thing is as a practitioner, and this is part of what we do in our practitioner training, Elena is a lot of people think that we're just, I don't know what they think about us. Cause I've been a practitioner for so long. I don't remember pre practitioner, you know, but it's like they, it's almost like we're okay to just go out there. We are doing something different. We're out on the, my license is on the line every day when I stand up for truth. And that's okay. I, I choose to do that. But to be able to work with people like you and Greg, where we're, we're, where I'm not alone, right? I think a lot of people, like, we're standing up doing that. We, we're, we're all in our little box, whether we're in a virtual box or we're, we're in an office building where we're seeing patients one on one or in groups it's community for us as well. And so that's what I really appreciate this and all the energy from everybody on the call tonight. It's just, it's so life-giving to me. And I just want to say thank you for that opportunity as well. So that, you know, we're all in this community together. Yes, we absolutely are. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tom. I will see you back in Utah in a few days. Um, we head out on Monday and it's, it's, it's a two day, it's a two day drive from Washington back to Utah, but I can't wait to see you. And thank you again. I'm so honored that you will come last minute and come join everyone who came tonight. Thank you so, so much for coming. It's an honor for us to get to share our heart, for us to get to share our knowledge and our wisdom um, and even our stories of our own transformation so that we can help be a roadmap for your own healing. Um, feel free to jump in and give us any closing thoughts that you have, everyone in the in the in the chat box tonight. And uh, we will see you again in a couple of weeks. Be sure to go to um, mhhinnercircle.com and check back because while you're not seeing any future ones scheduled yet, we are creating an entire lineup for 2024 and I'm going to be bringing in more guests. So some of the inner circle calls will be me doing my, my traditional teaching that I like to do with slides and I go in and teach you stuff, but we're going to be incorporating more guests. And if you enjoyed this, if you are a frequent 
newcomer to our inner circle calls and you enjoyed this kind of a different format uh, where we came in and we had these very intimate, candid discussions, put a one in the box and let us know that because we want to continue bringing you new content. Um, we even have an idea of doing kind of like a a live show where we go into the studio podcast and we have like Dr. Tom and maybe two or three other people. And we're all taking turn, you know, we're all talking candidly about a topic that we're passionate about where you get to be a fly on the wall and you get to hear our discussions and you get to hear from some of the top people on the planet who are, you know, not only not we're not the top ones and the best ones because we're the smartest ones on the planet, but we're pretty, we're pretty up there, but it's because of our head heart coherence. We love what we mm. do. We want to see this planet heal. And if you want to keep coming, just let us know in the chat box, throw it in with a bunch of ones. And we're going to come up with a whole new lineup for 2024. So thank you so much for joining us. We love you. And we're sending you so much love and light. We'll talk with you soon. Bye.